would be you could create a situation where citizens are much more competent, confident, and so on, and able to deal in a world of difference, diversity, and so on. But the big question is, and there's a bigger question floating around, and you know that bigger question, that bigger question, of course, is what is the world like today? And that world today, of course, is massively transforming in one way or another. And you know, at one level, it's just industry transforming into a knowledge economy, but it's also in many other ways too. So <coughs> this world that is in motion in one sense or another, enabled by things like the internet, etc., etc., is obviously quite uh, strange. And in a way, we're all closer together. Perhaps the tyranny of distance has disappeared. But if you just look at these flight paths, this is just taken yesterday, of the planes zooming into Europe, you can see there's a hell of a lot of movement, not only of people traveling to Luxembourg, but movement in general all, all around. This is just the planes at yesterday at 5 o'clock. And what that's doing is bringing all kinds of people together in, 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 in odd ways, which have different views of life, as we well know. This is a video store in Malaysia. It's quite interesting um, in its own way, of course. And that leads to a sort of global culture which is good and bad, and it affects, obviously, our identity. And obviously, we also know that our identities are never really pure. They're rather mixed in lots of ways. For example, I look very English, but I'm really all my blood is German, if you want to go down that route. So it, what you see is not always the, what you actually get. But the interesting point, if we just graphically think of a city, are these just people, just specks in the landscape? Or are they in some way brought together and are connected? Or is it just a question of parallel lives? And the strength of diversity under certain conditions is when we get beyond the situation of parallel lives. Now, many people find these processes quite invigorating and exciting at one level. Others find it, of course, the absolute opposite. It's frightening and so on. And so you get all these, you know, pro and anti uh, attitudes towards the question of, of diversity as a whole. But what I can say is there's no doubt that everywhere we go in the world, and this is the Shanghai Expo, the pavilion of the future, people are thinking about these sorts of questions. What will our cities be like? How will they shape themselves? Can we again reimagine the links between housing and nature? How do these different dwellings look like? What do they feel like? And so on. And indeed, can we envisage a sort of future where these mixes of people can live in relative degrees of, of let's call it, harmony for the moment? Now, I think you all know that all of these changes are happening in a context of, you know, there was an industrial city, etc., etc., became more knowledge intensive over time. And now, clearly, one of the issues you're talking about when you incorporate design thinking into that process is really adding an extra dose of creativity into the way cities and places function, and of course, companies as well. Now, the issue is. Since everyone is thinking that, what is the emerging advantage for you, you as Luxembourg, in this context? And of course, there is the bigger threat, not threat, perhaps opportunity, I don't know. Of course, the world is shifting towards the east. But one of the issues which relates to this question of diversity is, of course, 15 years ago or a while back, people used to go to places because of the job or the company. That's now completely changed. People go to places because they like the place and then think of the job second. Now, if this place, this place, let's say Luxembourg, is one that is open to difference and all of these uh, different possibilities, then it's likely to be much more successful. And you just look around you wherever you are, this happens to be Helsinki, you can see the signs which are really saying, these different people, they have some sort of skills somewhere, talents that we obviously want to have, and we also want to keep the talents we already have in our cities. Unfortunately, this is cut off, but just as we're talking about diversity, diversity is also about age. Like for this example, is this woman wrinkled? 
or is she wonderful? So when I'm talking about diversity, I think I'm also talking about the broader sense of diversity too. Now, some would say that these shifts that I'm discussing represent a, 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 you know, a paradigm shift. Whether you want to use that word or not doesn't matter. The main point is that we're moving in a situation which was one that was very much about planning in a predict and provide way to one where we're trying to plan and think through things in from planning the known to creating the conditions to be able to deal with the unknown and the unpredictable. And of course, I don't need to mention the sort of fragility of what I'm talking about and how that actually feels in places, because although I'm being positive about diversity, the reality is there's a lot of tension around in general. So let's look at this just for a moment a bit more closely. Now the city, of course, I don't need to tell you, is the most complex designed artifact ever made by human beings. And the fact is, of course, it's usually created from within a specific cultural perspective. Uh, and that cultural perspective is usually increasingly uh, an engineering perspective, actually, because you just you know, make it sort of fit some easy template to build the city, just looking where our hotel is. That could be anywhere in the world if I just took a photo of it. Um, but the city, this complex thing, the city, actually could be much richer in terms of how it's thought through if we took all the skills and perspectives of those who are in them uh, and brought them together in the way the city looks and feels. Um, perhaps in the case of Luxembourg, it was nature that shaped the city rather than us actually shaping it, given that it's sort of such a hilly place and so on. Now, do I believe, given what I'm saying, that we can, do I believe in reincarnation, basically? Am I positive about the potential of this? And I, I personally have to be, uh, because I've just decided to be. And that is really then about how do I create this different type of city that looks and feels uh, and, and, and has a completely different sort of atmosphere. And I think there are sort of four lenses you can look at this, and I want to highlight this idea of what I'm calling civic urbanity, which is trying to recapture that ideal of the European city. And the four lenses I think we could look at uh, of this, this civic urbanity, this is this ideal revisited, is focusing on four dimensions. One, an understanding and incorporating in city planning and thinking the idea of cultural literacy, which is basically the sense of cultural stuff. Secondly, to embed this idea of healthy urban planning, that you're planning in a way that makes you healthy without having to go to the gym, which also means you're more likely to bump into each other in a chance encounter way. Thirdly, eco-consciousness, obviously. And fourthly, uh, what I call creative city-making. And what I mean by these things is the first is really seeing things culturally as this graffiti in Tel Aviv shows is certainly not the basic de uh, default position. And in fact, culture, which is the DNA of everything, can be an obstacle or a problem. So it depends what the atmosphere in a place is like in order to promote this um, an opportunity. And in some sense, it really is the other invisible hand. There's the invisible hand of the market. But the thing that really drives everything is, is, is culture as the real invisible hand. I mean, if you just look at these three streets from three different continents, you can see it's the same street, but completely differently conceived. And this last one happens to be in Albania. I know in Luxembourg they want to talk about Albania. But this is interesting, isn't it? Because this building and these shops and all of that, the others were also in Australia and in Asia, they're very different. This one is telling you where the airport is, and it's very clear which direction that is. <laughs> but that's in passing. Um, and then, in terms of the healthy urban planning, most planning, of course, is very segmented. It's very hardware-driven. And everything here is logically conceived. This is Perth, Australia. But the result is a nightmare because nobody with social understanding and understanding of human emotions was involved in creating this. And most places in the world are really like that, basically disappointing and so on. 
dear, this is Sal Paolo, last week you just ran a motorway straight through your eyesight, uh, and so on. And this is the result, places you know, you've been to, we didn't really plan for this. So healthy urban planning is actually getting rid of that and thinking about that differently, which really is about you know, hanging around and sitting about and all those sorts of things. And the eco-consciousness thing is, of course, actually planning in such a way that you're healing the environment. And Freiburg is a good example of that. This place called the Zonda Sunship is a complex of buildings and structures which co-designed by architects and artists, which is you sort of know when you're there that it's a different place. And finally, what I'm calling creative city making is really that change between hardware thinking and blending hardware thinking with software thinking, which starts from the person outwards and their diversities and mixes of differences, and blends that together with the hardware, rather than just saying, let's do the hardware and you can sort out how you feel about it later. And that, to me, is a very important shift, thinking about this software thing. Because mostly the people who understand software of the city are usually in status terms very low, whereas in fact they should be very high. The other thing I think when we're thinking about this designing with a greater sense of vision and, and broader mind is to also think of the senses, not only the obvious senses, but also, I said several, about 50 senses. But one of them particularly is, I'm just pointing out, electrics. The electromagnetic fields in cities, which make you feel ill or comfortable or good, are one million times larger than they were 80 years ago. So if you just remind yourself that the electromagnetic field is one billion times stronger, that may be quite an interesting design challenge to think that through. So this is really about seeing the city through the senses first, rather than, um, you know, through the simple infrastructure needs. So that, what I'm really saying, implies that we can do a few reconsiderations. For example, trends. Clearly, the here and there phenomenon, you're here and there at the same time, my mobile is speaking something here, I'm looking over there talking to you, I've got faster networks, this sort of world shapes the way we think about who we are in this place, and who we're mixing with, and so on. The second read thing is really revisioning planning, which therefore needs to be far more involving and engaging with a far wider group of people, rather than the simplistic <coughs> economic dynamic leading to very soulless buildings in you know, the typical office block that looks pretty soulless and dead, may have glass but that may reflect back on you, maybe quite shiny, but is it really great? Then, really, it also reminds us that we can rethink the urban resources we have in the city. And what they are, of course, is in the skills and competence of people, which comes back to the point about the more people you've got with different views, the more potential you might have. And that really means also trying to make the invisible visible, because many of these assets of these people are completely unseen and so on. So finding ways of revealing them in the urban landscape of a physical public realm is incredible important. And that means, of course, that you would redesign the city in a different way, and I know we're going to talk about that later, spaces which might look and feel completely different than we have constructed so far. And what that then brings us to is a different story of the city itself, which each city has, of course, multiple stories. There's not one story. This multiple-layered story, which may be, in this case, a sort of breakthrough story that, that, that does something very unexpected. And more or less, finally, on this point, it requires also a different form of governance and representational structure. Who is actually being represented? I'd love to know who's represented in Luxembourg in the Parliament. Does it reflect the diversity of Luxembourg or not? And all of this requires a different form of bureaucracy, which is actually more open-minded and lots of other things as well, and reflects the diversity that we're just discussing at this moment. And finally, what that means is that the actual rules and 
regulations that one has would need to be reassessed. And a lot of this is, of course, about creating regulations which are not too specific, but based on principles and more on trust and so on. Now, I've asked people over several years, what cross-cultural <coughs> makes a great place? Give me the words that make you feel that this is a place you like. And this is across different cultures and different social groups. And the sort of things people say are, first impressions count. How do I arrive? What is the airport like? This happens to be real loud. What does that happen when I then actually get into the town? What is that feeling emotionally like? Because my first impressions are also my last impressions. They then say what I want is something familiar, something which is easy, a sort of good neighborhood, something where I sort of home from home, where I feel safe and secure, where my kids can play and so on. This is Barcelona. This, by contrast, is a business district in Amsterdam. I've never ever seen a child play there. And I'll give you 100 euros if you give me a picture with a child playing. <laughs> I don't put any cheating, yeah? But you get the point, it's quite clear, even from a feng shui perspective, that there would never be a child playing there, but is that a point? It's pointing at the corner of the building. But anyway, different aspect of life there. The other thing people are always asking for is human scale, great streets, and all of those sorts of things, because the essence of the great city, of course, is a great street. Uh, Well-designed, good materials, and all of that. All of this you know. The point I'm really saying is once these basic things are there, these, this sense of security, people open out. This is Sao Paulo last week. Every 200 meters or less, you have police men, usually men. And so that doesn't give you that sense that you can just move around and navigate uh, a city. So once that is there, though, that sense of safety, people want encounter exchange. <coughs> they want to cross fertilize. Because they know the city is about exchange, transaction, talking, doing things together in one way or another, where ideas are exchanged, etc., 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 which may lead to projects, may lead to services and products and economic <coughs> advantage. They then also want this sense of openness to other cultures when they feel safe in themselves in one way or another. They want their choices and possibilities. So you can read that chance street, you know, to be able to set up a business of some sort. They want mechanisms to be there that you can have a small business out of nothing. They want odd places where, you know, it might be an old container or something like this. This is a container park where <coughs> these companies here were set up. So it's a bit like an exhibition, uh, a museum exhibition on the outside. They want surprise and wonder, something that occasionally gives them some sense of, wow, I didn't realize that this was happening in this city. I'm not saying you put a Zeppelin straight here in, well, it would be quite good, actually, uh, in Luxembourg. But it could be anything. It could be a cafe that looks bizarre, that feels bizarre, and is all immersive in some sort of way. So once people feel relaxed again, they also want, you know, with the decline of religion, something that's spiritual, soulful, that gives them some sense of a higher purpose in their city. This is Valencia. The point being that all of this suddenly comes into play once people feel a basic sense of security. Then they think even once they feel safe, yes, let's have some temporary installations. And of course we know about the pop-up culture uh, that exists, new working formats like this pop-up office here. Quite interesting, you can just roll it along to the next down the corridor, uh, or even the things that you know about, strange billboards, and so on. This is Paris. And then within that, you occasionally want the iconic, the memorable, that something that is really so strange in your case, in your place. This is Roubaix, and here was an old swimming pool, and the guy was leaving, and the museum guy said, I need a museum. And he said, just put the museum in the swimming pool. And that, in a way, is iconic. Yes, a museum inside a swimming pool. You can do lots of things in that water, as you can imagine. Then people want things that are dynamic and edgy, vital in some sense, because within that vitality comes the critical mass that enables things to happen, which allows a sort of rich activity base to occur, for example, things like markets and so on. 
That, you can see, is obviously all quite stimulating. And within that, the external spaces is rather like an exterior living room, which is, could be a version of home from home. But whilst all of what I've said has been slightly overstimulating, people want the opposite, because great places have a diversity in another sense, which is peace on one hand and loudness and stimulation on the other hand. So that's what really identifies really interesting places. So you can move from one atmosphere, one quarter, or whatever you want to call it, to the next. And within that, and this is incredibly important, this sense of urban trust. Trust is perhaps the key thing about all of it. Here, an old guy and a young woman actually coexisting in the same physical space without needing perhaps to be watched by a CCTV camera in case everything happens. And within that, the great place, of course, has some sense of real deep locality, which is also globally uh, oriented. And because Sophie does live in the Netherlands, I thought this is so Dutch. <laughs> Nowhere else do you find that sort of machine where you buy hot, whatever it is you buy there. We, we don't find it in England. But you know when you see it that this is typically Dutch, or I think it anyway. And within this, I think the city can show its intent in the physical environment. Now, this happens to be a green version in Malmo Western Harbour, where you can see how the carbon neutrality works through the physical fabric and as you walk down below. But could, it could be in many other ways as well. And partly, given who you are, I'm sure you'll agree that what makes a culture life interesting is this balance and difference between fringe activities, wacky, slightly mad activities, with the mainstream as well. And these things playing off each other in some intricate sort of format and that is, of course, about, you know, today's classic was yesterday's innovation. So you need both these two things simultaneously. And then the obvious things like limits on noise and dirt and so on. You know, you want a bit of dirt, but not too much, because once it's too dirty, you feel slightly unsafe. So what you can see, I'm playing around with a sense of the organic and the planned, and that's always a very difficult balance. You know, here in Singapore, they want everything planned, and you lead to this innovation zone here called Biopolis that doesn't look very innovative uh, uh, in terms of the physical fabric. So what we've got here, I suppose, is a balance of wildness and order. And I don't know if this is ordered or wild. I'm not sure it's an Amsterdam. But this is NDSM around the corner. We're within <coughs> a wharf building. Lots of units and people work and do lots of other strange things there. So those are the interesting balances I'm continually showing up. New and old is another one. Amsterdam again, that new Java island, uses the template of the old, but it's very different in terms of how it appears, or here in Berlin, this interesting use of the museum, or here equally in Toronto. And what is very important from the point of view of interculturalism, is that this is a place that produces things. It's not just there for people to consume stuff. So it should be have enough spaces and places for incubation, and we're going to see one tomorrow. So again, you can see I'm always doing these ding-dongs, the flexible and the fixed, the organic and the plan. Spaces that are movable, multi-adaptable, etc., etc. Very difficult for the traditional planner to think through this type of place, which I think encourages the diversities that we're talking about. And then finally on this point, is about then creating a rich story of the past, present, and the future, which happens to be Berlin, as you can imagine. So where does it come from, and where are we going? Now, if I summarize this, and we put it in a sort of index, what do you look out for as a city, as a Luxembourg? There are probably 10 things, small points. What is the public framework like? Is that public framework one that's like sort of a bureaucratic spaghetti, which is siloed, or is it one that understands that you need to, across departments, send out some signal, some manifesto, that this is a place that encourages difference and all of the things that we're just talking about now, and that's willing to get out of its box and willing to rewrite the rules? 
The second point, how much is it allowing the distinctiveness to express itself in the urban environment in every possible sense, which I am calling really to some extent the soul of the city. <coughs> Thirdly, openness is the key thing. We're coming back to it again and again and again. What's the balance of openness and closeness in this place? You don't need to be open every single minute of the day, but is the default position to be more open than closed? And then this question of entrepreneurship. Is there an entrepreneurship across community, <coughs> private and public domain? Can you do interesting things like this escalator just in the open air, as well as be very positive about open source creativity? And here is a creative factory. We're seeing one tomorrow, but that one's in Rotterdam, as you know. Everything's called a creative factory. You've got to be careful. Don't call yours creative factory, too. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Then there's the issue of how is this place in terms of its strategic agility? Is it a place which is just an ordinary leaders who just dig holes and sort of say, yeah, and the people have said, I want that? Or is this a place where you have leaders who are willing to tell a story of that place that really gets beyond the short term? And if it is a good story, it tends to deal with the problems of people disagreeing because the story, if it's compelling, can do that. And then this, this city, this place, you have to say, what's my learning landscape like? Am I giving every category of person the possibility to learn? And is that learning embedded in the city? So it's a learning city, or is it in some campus in the middle of nowhere? Is it sort of a lifelong learning type situation? And how well does my city communicate? You could assess that. Is it communicating well internally between groups and externally with the outside world? Is this basically a zone where you can, where everything, for example, is Wi-Fi enabled? And is this place being conceived of using all of these resources of the people we've just discussed? Is it using all of these people together and creating, and I'm being a bit simplistic here, you know, Plato said the city is a work of art. Is the way the city conceives itself, thinking of creating a living work of art, where it's not only the physical, but also the activities of the people in their differences that is shaping this place. That then, I believe, will lead to some level of livability, good hospitals, good whatever, cycle paths, and so on. And most importantly, perhaps, is this place effective? Is it doing what it says it's doing? Now, I'm not quite sure initially I thought this was the most ineffective thing ever because the, the line paint was too lazy to shift the tree. But the more I look at this, I think this is the most inspired project I've ever seen, which came through sheer coincidence rather than planning. So, what that ends up with at the end, and I'm finishing off now is basically at their best. These interesting places we're discussing really have five components, which is they're places of some sort of anchorage. And that anchorage is even for those who come from the outside. It's a place of possibility. It's a place where there are connections of all sides, connections to their own diaspora, connections to their own place, connections <coughs> with the people here who have always been here. It's a place where you can learn and improve yourself, and ultimately a place you can be inspired. So it is about, in a sense, memory, having some form of memory that is credited and legitimized in this place, and this memory may be an old building, this sort of thing that you know, and this is a sort of creative factory type thing I suppose we'll see tomorrow, but it could be other things. A place of possibility here, Singapore, the possibility room in their national library. Lots of people went in there. I don't know what they were doing, but they seemed to think there was something there for them. So that possibility is all sorts of incidental things. And then that connection point, bridging between cultures and so on. And finally, learning centers that are open and transparent and not sort of places which you feel frightened to go in and where you feel you can learn in a lifelong way. 
So all of this is not necessarily about money. It's actually about changing the mind just a small bit. Thank you very much.